Okay, so my talk now is hunting the digital fox at 5 GHz. And since it's quite a nice title, uh, any ideas what this will be about? Why would we want to hunt the digital fox at 5 GHz? Someone, anyone? Come on. Did you post something on the mailing list about uh, disturbing signal that was... Ah, that's a clue. <laughs> it was a while ago. Okay, so hunting the digital fox. Yeah, you know all about me, I told you before, so I won't do this anymore. Okay, here we go. So hunting the fox is a ham operator activity. Uh, it generally consists of four hidden transmitters uh, that are scattered around the field, the forest, some hills, whatever. Um, and they basically transmit in a round-robin fashion. One transmits some Morse code, then the other one, and then the other one, and so they repeat in a few minute cycle. Uh, the task of basically hunters is to have a directional receiver and basically find the location of all nodes by running around, uh, getting a stamp on the average transmitter and returning to the starting line in the minimum amount of time. Uh, generally it's a two hour activity and it's quite fun, so if you want to give it a go, give it a go. Um, but how can such a ham radio operator activity apply to Wi-Fi? Or why should it apply to Wi-Fi? And what good can we get out of this? Okay, so today uh, let's imagine a scenario. Okay, so this is a description of a situation in Slovenia, which is a real-world situation of nice collaboration between a community wireless network and a wireless cable provider. So, we in Slovenia have a backbone node at Pohorje, a thousand meters above sea level, on top of a mountain, there's a nice tower. There are several systems up there, backbones to various Slovenian locations, a backbone to Austria, and suddenly some channels were jammed, we just couldn't use them, huge packet loss, no obvious reasons. Okay, we thought, okay, just more Wi-Fi networks, shit happens, things don't work, we'll just move to other channels and forget about it. But then, sometime later, like a week later, a uh, wireless cable provider uh, calls me up and they say their DOCSIS system, which is pretty much the uh, cable over the wireless and their uh, return link, so the uplink from clients is on the 5 gigahertz spectrum. So they have a downlink at about I know, 12 gigahertz and going back to the clients, uh, so from clients to their base tower on top of a mountain at 5 gigahertz. And their frequencies are jammed and this suddenly happened and no one had a clue why some random errors started appearing. Okay? So it was like, okay, someone built a Wi-Fi network, we'll just look for the SSID, tell them, can you please move a bit, and we'll be all friends. Right. So, uh, first they call me, hey, have you installed some new nodes recently? No. Why do you ask? And I knew something was going on anyway. So, uh, first we verified that do we jam each other. So it's always to be friends, uh, with service providers or anyone who professionally uses the same spectrum as you do. And we start testing, okay, I'll generate some traffic, do you see some packet loss, you generate some traffic, see what we uh, see and so on. And we figured out that if we have a link and we up the power, so we have the ERP about 50 dBm from about 10 kilometers distance pointing directly to their tower with full traffic, yeah, they see some problems, but that's far, far from a general use case. And the problems we generated with this, well, they were comparable to the problem, uh, pro well, situation we were observing. So, huh, if it's so hard for us to generate such a jamming case, there must be a network transmitting loads and loads of power, and we should be able to find it, in, you know, instantly. Like somewhere there has to be a huge spot of Wi-Fi signal. Okay, so we did the obvious thing. Scan with a Wi-Fi router, see what you can see. Something should be in the minus 50 dBm, minus 40 dBm range anyway. Um, yeah, 
everything below 90 DM. Mm. Now things get interesting. Mm. Well, yeah, everything looks alright and things still don't work. Okay? And here things get more complicated. So we started thinking in more detail, more systematically, what things could be there, what do we have to consider, what measurement equipment do we need, and all that. So, first of all, let's assume it's Wi-Fi traffic. So, if it's Wi-Fi traffic compliant, um, so legacy pretty much, you should be able to detect it with OpenWRT or pretty much anything. You have some like AirMax and W and V2 or basically every this TDMA protocols by different uh, providers. You can't really see all of it, but you see some uh, packets of it, and oh, you know something's going on. And you can have some evil networks. I won't say more about this now. Um, you can have other modulated uh, communications, but in the ISM band, they should be at least DFS compliant, um, and yeah, no one should be licensed to use this band. We checked the databases, no one was. So yeah, something funny was going on, and we can't really imagine someone building some random transmitter at 5 gigahertz and just operating for some odd reason, well, without some good purpose. Um, so the only licensed user is the weather radar, which we kindly avoid that Wi-Fi channel and everyone is happy. So yeah, okay, we have to consider all these options. And then we can consider uh, some non-modulated noise sources, which is quite an important aspect of Wi-Fi and other wireless networks, which people generally forget about. So uh, I've seen cases, and others have reported them as well, where damaged equipment, so like uh, water in equipment and all that, may basically cause the output amplifier to oscillate at some frequency and just, yeah, just transmitting oscillations without any modulation, without any useful data. Um, this. It's, yeah, it's a possible situation, it happens, but generally if the equipment is so broken, it will kill itself in a matter of minutes, hours, it won't work for a day. And since the problems were going on for now about two weeks, okay, probably not the case. Uh, you could see non, uh, some noise from, let's say, power supplies and equipment you have next to uh, where you have things deployed. But again, so these are kind of the three sections it's quite easy to consider. So if we go in more detail from the least likely to the most likely source. So um, as said, runaway oscillations of power amplifiers, transmitters, um, definitely have sufficient power to jam something. Um, but generally the effect is near field, meaning that um, the oscillations don't necessarily go into the antenna or if they uh, do, they're not of that high power. Um, as said, such runaway equipment usually burns itself out, and the spectrum analyzer is really good to find it, uh, because with Wi-Fi equipment, you probably won't be able to either get in the same range, uh, follow it moving up and down, so spectrum analyzer is the right tool. Um, power supplies, they don't go in the gigahertz range generally, so they go up to one megahertz normally, and one megahertz is far, far from what we generally use. Um, and this travels along power lines. Um, it's not on the air normally. So if you change power supplies, have a battery power supply for a while, you can kind of mitigate this problem, see if that's a problem or not. Um, so we kind of outlining different possibilities that I've kind of seen from experience that you might want to consider if you have a problem at some point. Um, so, in the scenario described, yeah, non-modulated noise sources are probably not the, the case here, but let's just think about it. Um, so, other modulated communications. So, if we look at the DOCSI system or some cable over the air uh, WASP applications. Um, so, the DOCSI system has a user base station that has an upstream in 5 gigahertz range, uh, but generally they use sound ranges. Um, the modulated communication then can have the biggest effect on wireless community networks and basically 5 and 2.4 or any network equipment uh, are FM radio transmitters. They can go up to 500 kilowatts, which is one, well, a hell of a lot of power, and they are about 100 megahertz. Funny enough, Ethernet is about 100 megahertz, 
um, well, at least if it's not gigabit. Um, and cables, generally, if you want to save on cost, you buy it worse cables. They're not that well shielded. And if you have a transmitter very near, you can have quite, quite big problems. Generally, you can see them that the link auto negotiation is jumping up and down and gets stuck at the end at uh, 10 megabits because that works 10 megahertz, it's not 100 megahertz. And whereas 100 megahertz kills it. We did actually tests to confirm this. Uh, mounted nodes next to an FM transmitter in, let's say, about 10 to 15 meter range. They were transmitting only uh, about uh, 5 kilowatts, so it wasn't such a big FM transceiver. Um, and the equipment used was Ubiquiti Nano Bridge and a TP Link. Quite a standard combination. So, um, what happens in such a case is first, things might work, um, then you will see that the Ethernet link is falling up and down, auto negotiation fails. You may force it, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Um, so, okay, you replace the cable with a fully shielded CAT7 cable with connectors you can barely find, and it still doesn't work. And, yeah, long story short, uh, if you want to use nano bridges in such situations, you have to add an aluminum shield around the feed so that that takes the round part of the feed and actually protects the Ethernet 5 chip and the transformer, which are most likely to be the places where things will be induced in the Ethernet system uh, and it works fine next to an FM transceiver now for a few years, but um, the actual nano bridge had to be uh, shielded and the TP-Link in a thick aluminum case. Um, whereas the cable was not such a big problem as first uh, assumed. Um, this was a slight, <coughs> slight detour, so consider this if you put things next to an FM tower. Um, and just checking whatever is in the licensed uh, spectrum, you can normally get the database of uh, the regulatory organization per location or whatever it's done in that country. Um, in our scenario, this kind of is plausible, but not the most likely thing. <laughs> the smash dog is pretty good. Smash um, dog. Yeah. So, uh, and the likely situation here is Wi-Fi networks. Okay, Wi-Fi. So, fair compliant Wi-Fi networks, 802.11, should be nicely detectable. Should generally have an SSID. Kind of easily detectable manageable, you know, normal stuff. Um, then we have all this AirMax and NV2 and all other protocols. Um, we generally should detect it with OpenWRT. It uh, kind of makes uh, sense to test with other systems. Where it gets interesting is they use non-standard channel widths. Like Ubiquiti really loves supporting some like 3 megahertz, 8 megahertz, 15 megahertz and some other odd numbers they come up with. Uh, not sure what the reason is. If someone has a good idea, please share it with us. Um, so... Range. Yeah, you can have longer range. And actually you can uh, change the Aphros chips, which are, for example, the TP-Links also to 10 or 5 megahertz. Yeah, 10 or 5 is, but why would you have 3, 8 and some numbers in between? Um, because, I don't know, 8 and 10 is not such a huge difference. Except for some minor noise um, yeah. optimization, but there might be bands in the world where you can't have so much bandwidth, so you have a narrow one. Possibly. Um, so someone decides to use something like this, you won't detect it with what you have, so you probably need a spectrum analyzer just to see it. Although we'll get get to that point, which might not even be the case, so you can see it with a spectrum analyzer, um, and you can have evil wireless networks that can be programmed to do whatever you want, or they want, or anything imaginable, but we'll get to that. So, uh, just a short overview over uh, spectral analyzers implemented in software on Wi-Fi chips. Ubiquiti has this AirView, it's a Java-ish application, um, <coughs> which works quite uh, well. There's not much detail about its operation. Uh, so some details would be nice, um, but it generally works the way it sweeps to, through the frequencies and just uh, remembers the power. I would assume it spends, it has a resolution of, 
I know a megahertz probably and spans at that frequency range between five and ten uh, microseconds and just sweeps all over all the time. But you could probably calculate something uh, from the RF frame rate or however they do it. If you have more details about this, feel free to share it. There is not much online about it. Um, so the spectra scan on Microtik takes 40 microsecond long samples at 10 megahertz steps. Um, so we see this is quite wide and some things might be missed. Um, yeah, and it well scans for things and again you quite easily see normal Wi-Fi networks. Um, spectral scan on OpenWRT, it's possible, doable, but it's not really available. So it's not. I don't think there's a good Lucy plugin and some uh, package that can do it. Yeah, I implemented that in ATH9K last year, but um, mostly only the kernel part and some uh, proof of concept visualization where you can just get the dump and load it in some graphic software. So it's not really live, but uh, it would be great to have a better. Uh, yeah, it would be great to have a lightweight shell-based horse-ish thingy to I look into that. Uh, I've heard of people working on that, but I have not found any cool. completed <laughs> implementation. Hopefully next year. Yeah. Hopefully next year. Okay, so for now, the best bet is use Ubiquiti or Microtik to do the scan and uh, don't really care about it. Here's another point. Uh, quite some regulatory agencies in Europe are using actually Microtik devices to test and measure things. Not sure if that is approved, but they definitely use it. The argument is, oh, we really don't want to take that heavy crate out of the lab and put it in a van and drive around with it, so we just use a Wi-Fi router. Um, if that's accurate or not, it's not a debate. So, uh, returning to the scenario described uh, previously. So, most likely case, as said, is there must be a Wi-Fi network with high power, a lot of traffic, jamming everything because that's the most similar case to what we observed. Um, we did scans with Ubiquiti, Microtik, found nothing really. We did scanning with OpenWRT, again found nothing. So that was rather weird. So we tried a spectral scan with a proper spectral analyzer. Um, if you go to uh, some normally wireless cable operators, they have uh, this network analyzer boxes that go up to a gigahertz and then you can use a down converter from 5 gigahertz to yeah, sub gigahertz level and get a proper spectral scan and that's not too expensive. You can actually build down converters yourself and connect them uh, to like a uh, uh, USB DVB-T dongle and have a spectral scan there as well if someone wants to play with that. That works quite okay-ish. Um, so, we had no proper results and things were still going on, so what now, okay? Let's, well, let's try to decode whatever's going on and maybe find something odd, I don't know, that's the last bet, okay? See what happens in traffic, there might be something really small that causes a lot of problems. So we resorted to OpenWRT and the horse tool, which is quite nice. Uh, it has auto-hopping, some traffic statistics, uh, it gives you channel utilization, well, it's supposed to be, uh, not sure what that figure is supposed to mean because there aren't that many details about it, and some more functions. So to do that, you should put the Wi-Fi interface in a monitor mode, uh, meaning you can't really use it at the same time, so you must have an alternative connection to the node you're running this to either Ethernet or some other wireless link to it. And to run it or your normal node, uh, install Horst and run this command which sets up uh, everything um, Yeah, as a monitor interface and runs Horst at the end. So if someone wants to play it, this is the fastest way how to do it. Um, the more detailed uh, things you can do with TCP dump, Wireshark, T-Shark, um, one of the nice features I found is, yeah, you have a TCP dump, create a pipe to get uh, data to the PC and watch it in Wireshark in real time, uh, and use Horst simultaneously to change channels and see the point of view from Horst and TCP dump at the same time. 
Um, so that can give you quite some nice correlations. See some things there, some things in Wireshark, or you know at least what you're looking for. Um, and then, yeah, well, analyze what you see, find something odd, and see what the hell this is about. That's the best idea we can come up with. So, um, to do some digital fox hunting or finding signals, you need some equipment. Uh, you need a highly directional antenna, Nano Breach uh, M5 22dB is probably the preferred tool. It's the smallest of Nano Breach dishes. It's very portable and sufficiently directional to find things. Uh, you can take the 25dB one, which is a bit bigger, so it's not that convenient to carry around. Or you can have a dish like this, which has 30 something dB uh, with a DIY fit. Um, and you can, you then need a directional system, but not a highly directional one, like a Nanostation Loco, or something that has a 100-ish dB uh, range, which kind of gives you a general perspective what you are looking at in your field of view, and an Omni antenna just to see all that's around you. Um, why all this, I'll explain a bit later. So, uh, I generally prefer Ubiquiti because you can easily run OpenWRT on it, or their firmware so to get a spectrum analyzer and it's sufficiently cheap. Um, you also can use a true spectrum analyzer, but they're well, quite expensive, so not something you generally have at hand. Um, back to the scenario, we to, well went to the terrain, uh, went to the location where we've seen trouble, and started looking around. So um, first. A general scan survey, see what Wi-Fi networks are there. If you see something high in power, yeah, that can be the cause. If not, move along, see what you can see with a spectrum analyzer that can uh, give you the idea of other signals with high amplitude in the same range. If that doesn't give you anything, well, you probably start decoding some traffic, see what horse says, or even move along to Wireshark TCP dump and all of that. Um, if the answer at this point of testing is yes, uh, the source that these things come from is somewhere at the distance, it's not local, you have to continue the work. If the source is local, you already found it and you should be able to mitigate it, solve problems and all that. In our case, we found out that some weird deauthentication packets are, are arriving at a very high rate from a distance. Okay. Now what? Um, so yes, it's a more complicated uh, setup and we need to get mobile to find where this is coming from. So the results from this testing were, in course, we've seen uh, this behavior, a lot of DLF packets at uh, basically consuming all the airtime, uh, but well, they're really small so the data uh, is not that much and the levels were not that high in the end. Um, we used Wireshark and TCP dump to capture that package, analyze the behavior, and most importantly, uh, get the MAC addresses to see what's the source, what's the destination, how they're changing. Um, so you, when you drive around, you actually know what you're looking for. You can set the filter and have your suspect in your eye without all the clutter that kind of comes in with the location. Um, so at the first point, we correlated the MAC addresses of this uh, whole crap uh, coming out uh, and took down measurements of the headings these things were coming from uh, with the nano bridge just moving around then taking a compass saying okay this is the direction writing down the heading and that pretty much is as much as you can do on a single location so preparing for terrain work number two we came up with the ore driving truck, okay? So, if you have pretty much any car that has uh, the railings on the roof, you add a ladder on it, a standard ladder normally people have, just bolt it up, and it's a perfect thing to put Wi-Fi equipment to. Uh, it attaches very nicely and doesn't cause too much problems. So, uh, we equipped the truck with five systems. There was an Omni antenna on top, um, connected with a coax cable down to the cabin, and either you attached a Wi-Fi router or a true spectrum analyzer on it. So, at the location you are, you could see pretty much power levels 
uh, that are on the location and see if there's you know, just a huge spike somewhere. Um, then there was a dish pointed in front. So uh, the application of that dish is you find the signal, you just get a nice parking space, you put the car there, slowly go in reverse and the car slowly turns. Oh, here's the maximum stop. Look at the heading, you know the heading, you know um, what the signal is coming from. For the reason of driving around, there's also a panel antenna, this about 100 uh, degrees wide, uh, nanostation loco or similar. So when you're driving and you have a signal not getting directly in your dish but slightly off, okay, there's something of interest, stop and find the proper direction. Um, and for the same reason, there's also a side dish and a side panel, so when you drive around, you don't actually pass what you're looking for. Uh, so if it's at the distance at the side, okay, oh yeah, there, that's the right distance, or you go around the corner or around the bug, hey, there it is. Uh, and when you have the front and the side system looking at them at the same time, when the car moves, you pretty much get the, a good idea where it's coming from. Um, from the RF perspective, you have to be careful with uh, these dishes because their edge is nice and rounded. They actually have another uh, so-called sweet spot where they get a very good uh, signal is directly at the back of the dish. So uh, front to back isolation is pretty bad on these nano bridges, uh, but the beam at the back is very very uh, thin. So if you if you put let's say two narrow bridges on a tower, from the RF perspective. Don't align them uh, horizontally and vertically, but just shift them for uh, at least a meter. Uh, because that will probably give you 10 or 20 more dB isolation between them. Um, so, we went toward driving, okay? That's a fun activity, right? You need at least a two-man team. Looking on a screen and driving is not safe, okay? Again, looking on a screen and driving is not safe and don't even try to do it. Um, so when you have a good idea what the source traffic or whatever traffic you're looking for is, you can start going around and seeing where that appears, setting up your filters so it just pops in, okay, here it is, and then you find better directions and better analysis and all that. Um, what we found is the optimum is to run horse on all systems, just having multiple uh, shell windows on the screen with horse. Um, set up on different same channels, whatever, with a filter, and you see on which system what pops up. And uh, you get the signal strength and all that. Um, always log everything, because if you don't find the source, you might want to look at the log and find some interesting information that is in there, where and how. So if possible, log the GPS location if you're driving around as well. Um, when you find at least two or three locations where you get the signal from, uh, block headings at home uh, because that gives you the chance to properly analyze things, think about it and uh, see what could be it. So with the log of locations, uh, signal powers and headings to the source of the signal you're looking for or the traffic you're looking for, you use radio mobile software. Do you guys know radio mobile? Yeah. Just one. Anyone else? Of course. Okay. Two? Okay, so I should explain a bit more. So Radio Mobile is a ham radio software which works very, very well for Wi-Fi. Um, so it gets the SRTM topology of the world. So it, you get the relief, so the heights in a uh, few hundred meters squares of the whole globe and you get the terrain of it. Uh, on top of it, it overlays Google Maps or whatever, so you really know where things are. And it can be used to say, okay, here's a node with such output power, such antenna characteristics, turn in that direction, uh, in that heading, and it can simulate where the signal will propagate um, and what will happen. With this tool, you can actually predict uh, the received power of uh, a Wi-Fi deployment in... Um, so in rural environment where you don't have buildings and other man-made structures up to about 1 or 2 dB accurately for links up to 100, 100 kilometers easily. But you have to do some calibration and have systems not to be uh, written in the software. So um, taking the software, 
um, plotting the visual coverage. So there's a nice option which says, I'm at this point, color me all points of the map that have a direct line of sight from the point I'm standing in that heading or in 300 degree heading or whatever. Um, so you do that from the three, at least three locations you have uh, observed your signal from. And that should give you an area of about 10 square kilometers or less, depends on how accurately you claim you have your heading right and how sure you are in your measurements, where the source of the signal is. Okay? Now you can export this radio mobile uh, in Google Earth and nicely look where things are, uh, see uh, what is there. Because Google Earth has all the images, you can scroll, oh, here's a tower, that's a potential source, or you get a much better idea what you could be looking for. Armed with the map, Google Maps, all this information, you start board driving again. In the board driving too, you go to the area where you think the source is. Um, when you are in the area, and because it's 5 gigahertz, most people transmit at least uh, with one watt or generally more, uh, it should be easily heard in the location uh, in the vicinity of that source. Um, so always look at all the systems because you can easily drive past it and in an hour maybe you generally find the source uh, if the train is a bit hillier and so on. Um, just please do mind when you find the owner, um, be kind to them and kindly tell them what the problem is and try to sort it out. Um, and no appropriate institutions if there's something very fishy going on. Um, or just be happy you found it for no real good purpose and you just like to get good at war driving. That might be of some use at some point. So uh, the results from the scenario is that we found a tower with an Ethernet bridge, which was apparently hacked or had a virus or something like that. It was a 10 megabit Ethernet bridge of a very important public utility company. Um, yeah, things get funny because the device dated back to 2008 with default firmware, <laughs> default passwords. <laughs> they claim it's not connected to the internet. There possibly is a firewall, but since there are default passwords, let's say no more. Um, anyway, the, sort, the traffic coming out of these devices was basically a DLF DOS attack, so sending the authentication packets everywhere, pretty much everywhere. Um, so, um, the, how it worked is actually very funny. So, the Ethernet bridge was transmitting with uh, several different source MAC addresses, which were generated by the key where um, the first four basically hex uh, letters were changing the rest were zero, okay? Not sure what good that is, but okay, let's put it there. And the destination MAC in the several streams were first the uh, four sets were equal and the rest was randomly generated in an uh, incrementing manner uh, in several streams. The funny thing here is this device is not targeting any specific network, any specific device to <coughs> deauthenticate, which is kind of general practice of deauthentication attack anyway. Um, and since it's incrementing uh, the vendor, so the third section, which is still the vendor section, it's just yeah aimed at all vendors, yay, or whatever vendors uh, fall in that area, which are well, quite many. Um, so this is not targeted at anyone, it's just bumping out crap at all time, obviously jamming everyone. And since most stations were receiving it at minus 78 to minus 80 dBm, um, this was generally in 1, 6 or even up to 18 megabit uh, bit rates, um, usually filling all the air time. Um, it was just there, it wasn't the strongest of the power, but apparently it is very effective at jamming stations. Um, so we notified them that there is a problem, and they were of course unaware of it, and not much happened, but yeah, uh, uh, 
we don't need to discuss this. The lesson learned from uh, this whole experience is first you have to know what tools you have available so you can really search the spectrum, see what's going on, uh, and find the source of whatever might be bothering you. Um, and always observe odd behavior. If you some, at some point see, oh, the authentication packets or some other packets in a huge, huge number which generally shouldn't be there, yeah, that's definitely something to be concerned about and having a better look at. Uh, with the right hardware, you can easily pinpoint any 5 gigahertz node almost uh, in almost any environment, even in cities. Um, what is the most worrying here is that just a handful of devices uh, can pretty much kill the 5 gigahertz spectrum in a huge area, especially if they're placed on a mountain or so. Um, for example, with a DOS attack of this kind. Uh, and since we have very limited channels, if devices start randomly getting viruses, hacks, or whatever, uh, doing this attacks will pretty much just shut down our networks and we couldn't uh, do much about it. Um, but if well, we at least discover where the hell this is coming from, there might be a solution, hopefully. Um, and the fun side of all this, for driving is very fun. I mean, who wouldn't want to do it for a week or so until they find those devices? Um, and this summary of all methods I came up today is basically, it's not a timeline log, but it's the process you generally go through and is an incomplete set of things you kind of have to consider when you get a task like this. Um, all feedback would be appreciated. Uh, ideas, how to improve this, maybe build some tools would be good as well. Uh, that could be useful either here at Batflash for other testing and in the real deployments. Uh, I will give you some uh, examples of this operation. So the um, Radio Mobile is this nice software which deserves a bit more attention. So um, this is a nice map of Slovenia, um, the location I was exploring, but uh, let's just go from the beginning. So, this software you can tell uh, at that GPS location, uh, generate me a map of size 25 and something kilometers, um, and you get data from those files or get it from online if you don't have uh, files on the computer. So you extract the topology, which kind of looks like this, and it's just heights of the terrain uh, at all points in this map. You say, okay, I want to overlay it uh, with Google Maps, for example, and I just say it draws the Google Maps on, over on top, so you see how the thing looks. Now, um, what you have to do, generally, is to insert under units, just add locations you have, uh, there, uh, just the location and the elevation will be automatically calculated. Uh, here we have the example of location 1, 2, and 3. So these are just locations entered in the system. Now, uh, here we see some more locations because I have quite a lot of them in the system, but here we see location 2 is here, um, location 1 is here on top, and location 3 here is in the downtown city. Now. Um, this neat function that tells us visual coverage, for example, let's say, in the location one, so that was on top of a mountain, um, and let's look up what it says. So in the location one, we've seen the signal coming from the heading 25, okay? We've seen the signal coming from the 25 heading, but we can't be really sure it was 25 heading, so let's say from heading 20 to heading 30, um, draw me what I can see in that direction from the point I'm at. And you say draw. Okay? Um, and this has drawn the, this location one. And these are all points of the terrain you can see from that location. Being high on the mountain, you can see most of it. Um, and then you pretty much repeat the procedure for, let's say, location two, which has a heading of zero. Uh, so let's say from heading minus 5 to heading 5 and we can change the color to easily see it okay and let's say yeah draw this um, 
I keep it in the same picture, and then we see this location was slower, and the hill has a smaller actually field of view. Um, and yeah, the last one has heading 328. Um, so let's say do this visual coverage from the location 3, uh, and we say uh, 3 to 8 minus 5 is 3 to 3, and 3, 3, 3, okay, um, and do it for this one, let's pick another fun color, okay, draw, okay, and we've taken this part, part, which is downtown, so it has a small field of view, and it points somewhere in this direction, okay, um, so this gives us a very good idea, and here where the, we have a cross section of all, all the fields of view, it's most likely that the point we're looking at is plus minus a few meters, but it, this method turns out to be very accurate at quite good distances. So we can say, uh, save this map, um, um, not save this map, but save the image, uh, where it is, save picture as, um, so we say picture battle mesh, okay. Um, so now we say we want um, Google Earth, which is translated to Slovenian for some reason. Anyway, um, so the nice thing about Radio Mobile is when you save an image, it's an, it gives you an KML, so a Google Earth file with it. Uh, that can overlay the given image in Google Earth. So you can actually place whatever you simulate and draw for your networks directly on <coughs> Google uh, Maps, which is quite good for planning networks and all that. Anyway, I place this in some folder. Um, yeah, and it's Windows, so it's really hard to find anything. Um, so, Battle Mesh KML, open it up. So, we open the KML, it we see it contains the JPEG image, and this is the overlay of Google Earth, uh, clicking on it, uh, somehow you can also adjust the transparency of it. Anyway, you can see the real place, the location as we were, um, zooming in and tilting will show us, yeah, so you see that the terrain is quite hilly. Um, yeah, and the point, point one, on the other side of the hill, oh, come on, <laughs> oh, that's fun, anyway, um, so point one is somewhere here, and we want to look up, so this is the actual visual line we can see from this point, the, from the other point, and from all other points, um, so zooming out a bit, we see the different locations, we made measurements, kind of result in this location, okay? Result in this location and we see that it's a nice hill, okay? Moving across the hill, some houses. Anyway, I know what I'm looking at now, but here we see, oh, okay, here's a church, okay? What could be in a church? Well, not much, but actually next to the church, there's our tower of our network, uh, which I'm using for this example. And here's a ham radio tower with quite some Wi-Fi equipment mounted on, and that's the way you easily locate it. The actual source in the example I was introducing earlier was somewhere in this area, so it wasn't far off. Um, but it was turned the other way around. So the data shown here today is not real, but it's very close to real data. Um, that would be it. Um, questions, feedback, debate. Anything? Well, we should we should do the fox hunting here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, I yeah. was actually we thinking. Just hide this. Of course. Yes. In the next. Two point four gigahertz. Oh. Somewhere. Yeah. With. And it should transmit something random, not an SSID or something. Okay. <laughs> no, I think we have our node we have to find here. <laughs> Well, that's very easy. That's good for the sofa. <laughs> the, fun, the funny thing is that conventional uh, 
the detection of sources, well, what you do with normal radio transmitters, don't work well for Wi-Fi. So using Wi-Fi equipment is in fact all very expensive equipment, good, because normally you point in a source of energy, but Wi-Fi is just a source of energy for a few microseconds, and then it's gone again. And then So it's exactly. really a trouble for conventional getting a bearing with the standard equipment. That's, I think, why they like to use Wi-Fi equipment, because normally you have maybe 10 different sources at the same time within a window of a millisecond, and the Wi-Fi chip gives you an address of each of them. So you can yeah. say uh, which address you're getting. Without the Wi-Fi chip, it is really, really hard to do. Yeah, so general spectrum analyzer is pretty much useless to locate things because with it you can locate anything and there's no way to identify what you're looking at. Um, the, in old times they... Well, uh, here's a fun story. Um, how to actually locate pirates transmitting radios. It turns out that uh, oscillators in radios vary from a radio to radio and from the transmitted audio signal it's possible to get a pretty much unique description of the device because there's such so taller, much tolerance in, in the devices being built and by just listening in the radio you should be able to identify or get a footprint of the radio being received um, that's one interesting case uh, how it's being used now or recently accelerometers in phones uh, are all different due to manufacturing as well and each can be used to see their own footprint and so on. Off topic anyway. Other questions? Otherwise, I believe the firmware is ready and we're starting to deploy the nodes, right? Not yet. Not yet? Okay, so we should speak some more. Anyone else? All right, thank you very much then uh, for the attention and see you around.